G'day guys, today we're going to create the game Connect4 using JavaScript and we'll be using the HTML5 canvas to do this as well as a game loop. So go ahead and download this template if you haven't done so already. So first of all we'll have to set up our canvas and context. So set up the canvas and context. Uh, var canv will equal document dot create element create element and then we can use canvas in quotes there. We'll have to add that to our uh, body. So document.body.appendChild and we can just pass the canvas uh, variable. And now we can set up our context. So var ctx context will equal canv.getContext and we need 2D there. Now we need to set up our dimensions. This is the dimensions of our canvas, our game. So var height and width, height, width. We'll also want to set this dynamically. So we'll create a function soon called set dimensions that we'll call. And we'll also call that when the window is resized. So we'll have to add an event listener. Event listener. We'll put that on the window. So window.add event listener. The type of event listener is resize. And what will we call when we resize? We'll just call that set dimensions function. So we'll set up our set dimensions function. So we'll go function set dimensions. We'll want to set our height and width. So height will equal window dot inner height. Width will equal window dot inner width. We'll want to set our canvas height and width here too. So canvas dot height will equal height, canvas.width will equal width. We'll probably want to call a new game here as well. So we'll just set some of this up now. Uh, so just above function new game. Uh, we want to create a grid in there, create our, four, our connect for grid. So we'll create a function called create grid, function create grid. In order for this to do anything, we'll have to set up a game loop. So just under our event listener there, game loop. Uh, we'll create some variables. We need to keep track of the time delta. So that's the difference between frames as such and the last frame time. Uh, we'll have to use the inbuilt function request animation frame, which we'll call our loop function. We'll create that now. Function loop, uh, it has a parameter. It basically represents the current time, so we'll call that time now. First of all, we'll have to initialize time last. So initialize time last. Uh, so if not time last, that means it's null or undefined, then we'll say time last will equal time now. So that'll only run once. Then we'll have to calculate the time difference. So calculate the time difference. Uh, so time delta will equal time now minus time last. That's in milliseconds. So to get seconds, we'll just divide that by 1000. That's in seconds. And we'll also have to keep track of our time last for the next frame. So time last will equal time now. After that, we'll do some updates. We won't do anything yet. Then our draw functions. We'll set up one draw function called draw background. And finally, we need to call another, call the next loop. So call the next frame or loop or whatever you want to call it. Request animation frame loop. So just below, let's create our draw background function draw background. We'll need to set the fill style. So context.fill style will equal, we'll set a constant soon called color background. And we'll also have to draw a rectangle. So fill rect. It requires the x and y, so 0, 0. The width is our width of the canvas and the height is the height. So head up and let's create this constant color background. So just up above where we set up the canvas, this will be our constant colors. So const color background will equal, you can choose any light color that you like. I'm going to choose mint cream. 
So let's give that a go. There we go. It's a fairly pale color, but that's all we want. To get rid of these scroll bars here, we'll have to set up some CSS. So let's do that now. So just up in our style tags here, we'll have to set up some styling for our body. So body, its uh, margin is going to be zero. And we'll need to set its overflow to hidden. Uh, we'll also need to set some styling up for the canvas. So canvas, its display is going to be block. Let's give that a go. Yep, those scroll bars are gone and our background is taking up the entire window. Good. Now we'll have to set up our game grid. So just above where we've declared our colors there, let's set some game parameters. Game parameters. We'll need to know the number of columns and rows of our grid. So let's set up two constants. Grid coals will equal seven. That's just from the original game, the original Connect 4 game. Number of game columns. We'll need to know the number of rows. Grid rows will equal six. Number of game rows. We'll also need to know the size of the circle where you push, where you put the piece. So we'll call that grid circle. Uh, it'll just be a fraction of the cell size. So let's say 70%, so 0.7. That'll be circle size as a fraction of cell size. And we also need to know the margin that goes around the outside of the grid. So we'll just call that margin. Uh, we'll set it as a fraction of the shortest screen width because we could be dynamically changing the screen size. So let's say 1 50th, 0 0.02. Margin as a fraction of the shortest screen dimension. Let's set up a color. So we'll have something similar to this. Color frame, we'll call it. We'll equal dodger blue. We'll need to set up some uh, game variables. So just above where we set up our dimensions there. Game variables. We'll need the grid, which will just be an empty array to begin with. And inside our dimensions here, we'd like a margin. And we'll set that up in our set dimensions. Just before we start a new game, we'll go margin will equal our margin fraction from above times the minimum, so math.min of height and width. So let's go to our create grid function up here. First thing that we'd like to do is initialize our grid because it could change. And we'll set up our cell size and our margins. So set up cell size and margins. So let cell, and we'll have a margin for each of the x and y directions. So margin x and margin y. Let's assume that we'd like to maximize the size of our game grid. So we'll have to detect when the device is in portrait orientation or landscape. So portrait and landscape. So how can we detect if it's in portrait uh, orientation? Well, if the width minus the margin times two, because there's a margin on either side, all of that multiplied by the ratio of the number of rows to columns, so grid rows divided by grid columns, if all of that is less than the height of our device minus twice the margin, so margin times two, then we can say that we're in portrait mode. And at all other times, we're in landscape. Now in portrait, the size of the cell will just equal the width minus the margin times two. All of that divided by the number of columns, so grid cols. The margin x will just equal the predefined margin. And the margin y will equal the height minus the cell size times the number of rows, so grid rows. All of that divide by two, right? Now in landscape, the cell size will equal the height minus the margin times two, all divided by the grid 
rows, right? The margin x will equal the width minus the cell times the grid columns, all divided by 2, and the margin y will equal margin. Now we'll have to populate the grid. Populate the grid. Uh, we'll have to loop over our array. So for let i equal 0, i is less than the grid's rows, i++. plus plus. We'll have to initialize the grid's the uh, row. So grid i will equal a new empty array. Loop over the columns. So for let j equal 0, j is less than the grid cols. J plus plus. Uh, we'll have to calculate the position of each of the cells. So we'll have a left and a top, for example. So let left equal, so that'll be equal to the margin x plus, now the left is based off the j, the column, isn't it? So j times cell. Let top equal the margin y plus i, which represents the row, times the cell. And let's populate the grid. So let i, j equal, we'll have to create an object or a class or something called new cell. It will take, it'll be basically a rectangle. So it'll have a left and a top. It'll need a width and a height, which is just our cell size. And we'll need to know its row and column number as well for calculating positions later. So we'll just pass i and j. So let's go up the top and create our cell class. So just under where we have our constants up here, let's create a section called classes. So class uh, cell, wasn't it? We'll need a constructor. Now the constructor, we need to take the left, the top, the width, the height, and we also passed the row and column number, didn't we? So this dot, uh, we'll give it each of the sides. So this dot bottom will equal the top plus the height. This dot left will equal the left. This dot right will equal the left plus the width, right? This dot top will equal the top, uh, the width. So this dot w will equal w, this dot height, this dot h will equal h. Uh, the row and column, so this dot row will equal row, this dot column will equal column. We'll also need to know the center of it because we'll be drawing circles in there. So this dot, we'll call that cx. cx will equal the left plus half the width, right? Width divided by 2. This dot cy will equal the top plus half the height. Height divided by 2. And the radius. So this dot r will equal, remember we had that radius from above, so it'll be the width multiplied by the uh, grid circle, I believe we called it. That's just the ratio. So 0 0.7 of that. But because it's a radius, we'll have to divide that by 2. So we'll have to add an owner as well, so we know what color to paint it. So we'll set that initially to null. So this dot owner equals null. When it's true, we'll define that as the player. When it's false, we'll define that as the computer. Let's go down and draw the circle. So we can add a function. We'll say draw the circle or hole. They'll be the same size. We'll name that function draw. We'll pass a context. I'll just paste in some JS doc here to let my editor know that we're dealing with a context. Canvas rendering context 2D. You don't have to do that if you don't want to though. So let's work out the owner color. So let color equal, so when the owner is null, we want to show the background, don't we? We want to show a hole. So this dot owner, if it equals null, we'll use the background as our color. Else, uh, if this dot owner, that means it's true, we'll use a color for our player, which we haven't defined yet, but we will soon. And otherwise, we'll use the color of the computer. 
Now we can draw the circle, draw the circle. So we'll set the context.fill style first. Fill style will equal the color that we just worked out. We'll need to begin the path in order to draw a circle. Context.arc, that's the actual curve as such. Uh, it requires an x, which is going to be this.center, cx, uh, this.cy. Uh, the radius is just going to be this.r. We need to know the starting angle, 0. The end angle is math pi times 2, which is 360 degrees. We don't need the last one. And finally, we just need to go this, sorry, context.fill to draw the circle. Let's go up and create those colors now. So in the same way that we've created the color for the background, let's create one for the comp, for the computer. It'll just be red. Uh, I'm thinking that later we'll need to have a darker color for the edges and so on. So we'll call that color comp DRK dark. We'll make it just dark red. Similarly for the player, we'll have, so color play will equal yellow. You can choose whatever colors you like. The dark color will be olive. While we're here, we may as well add another color for the bottom of our frame. We'll call that, say, the butt of the frame. Just to give a graphical representation of the uh, bottom of the frame, we'll call, we'll say that's royal blue, just a little bit different shade of blue. Now let's go down to our loop. And we'll have to draw our grid now. So draw grid. Head down to where we draw our background, just after there. Function, draw grid. And the first thing that we'd like to draw is our frame. Frame and butt. So we'll have to calculate the width and height of our frame here. So we can do that by grabbing the top left cell. So let cell equal grid 0, 0, the top left. Let the frame height, so FH will equal the cell's height multiplied by the number of rows, right? So grid rows. Let the width, so frame width equal the cell's width, cell.w multiplied by the grid's column, the number of columns, grid cols. And then we can set up the color of our context. So context.fill style will equal the color of our frame. And to draw the rectangle, we can go context.fill rectangle. And that will equal, sorry, fill rectangle. The x will be the left of our cell, cell.left. The y will be the top of our cell, cell.top. And the width will be our FW, and the height will be our FH. So we finally have something to test. Let's give that a go. Looking good so far, so try resizing the window. Yeah, that's resizing well. Awesome. Let's open up a device. So when we switch between uh, portrait and landscape, yeah, that's adapting well. Great. Now the butt, I'm thinking we can just draw a thin plastic strip down the bottom. So let's set the color first. So fill style will equal the color frame butt. And we'll draw another rectangle. So fill rectangle. The X will be the cell dot left minus say half the margin. So margin divided by two. The Y will be the cell dot top plus the height of the frame, so frame h minus half the margin, margin divided by 2. The width will be the frame width plus the margin because we've got half a margin on either side. And the height of this little strip will just be the margin. Okay, let's give that a go. There we go. We have a little blue strip down there just to represent the bottom of the uh, the playing grid. Looks all right. Now we can draw the cells, or the circles, or the holes, or whatever. We can just use a for of loop here. So let's uh, row of grid for let cell of row. 
And we've already created the draw function on our class, haven't we? So we can just go cell.draw. It requires a context, so we can just pass CTX there. Let's give that a go. Great, we can see all the holes looking good. You can adjust the size of the holes using our constant up above. Currently it's 0.7. If you want it to be bigger or smaller, you could adjust it if you like. Now let's set up some highlighting. So head up to our cell up above where we're drawing it. We'll have to set, just as, we, just as we've got an owner here, let's set up a highlighter. We'll just, we'll just call it highlight. Highlight will equal null. Under where we draw the circle here, let's draw highlighting. So if this dot highlight doesn't equal null, then we'll do some highlighting. So let's set the color first. So color, we already have a color variable up above. So color equals this dot highlight. If it's true, that means it's the player color player, else it's the computer, color comp. We'd like to draw a circle. How about we represent highlighting as a circle around the perimeter of the circle? So draw a circle, draw a circle around the perimeter. So we'll first of all set the stroke width, the line width, line, Width will equal this dot radius divided by say four. We'll set the stroke color. So this dot stroke style will equal the color. We'll draw a circle similar to how we've drawn it up there. Context dot begin path. Context dot arc. Now the X will just, it'll be identical to this really, won't it? So we'll just copy that in there. And we finally need to call stroke in order to draw the stroke. So we'll have to detect when the mouse is uh, moving over the canvas. So we'll have to add a listener here. We'll add to the canvas, canvas.add event listener. Now the type of event listener is mouse move, I believe, yes. And we'll call something, we'll call a function called highlight grid. Uh, we'll have to keep track of whose turn it is. So in the game variables up here, let's create a, a variable, a boolean called player's turn. And also when the game is over, we don't want to detect these uh, mouse movements either. So we'll set a boolean for game over as well. So let's go down and create highlight grid. Just down below here, just underneath the draw functions. Function highlight grid. It will take uh, an event. Oops, it'll take an event. I'll just paste in some uh, JS doc again, just so I recognize we can recognize it as a mouse event. Now, if it's not the player's turn, so if it's not the player's turn or it's game over, well, we don't. We just want to return. We don't want to detect mouse movement. I'll put a to do here for testing purposes. We don't want to do this. So to do. And if it gets through, we want to call another function. We'll just call that highlight cell. And we want to pass an X and Y coordinate. So we can grab our X and Y coordinate from our event. So event dot client X and event dot client Y. Just while we're here inside our new game function, we'll set the player's turn. So player's turn, we'll say it's a 50% chance of being the player's turn at the start of the game. So math.random, if that's less than 0.5, it's the player's turn, else it's the computer's turn. And we'll also need to set that game over. So game over will equal false. So let's create the highlight cell function, just above here, highlight cell. It takes an X and Y coordinate. Now in Connect 4, you only have seven options, right? You can only drop a piece into one of the columns. So let's identify that column. Let col equal null to begin with. We'll have to loop over our grid. So for let row of grid, for let cell of row, 
first of all, we'll need to clear any existing highlighting, won't we? So clear existing highlighting. We can just do that by going cell.highlight equals null. And now we'll have to get the column number because that's the only thing that we're interested in. Get the column. We can do that by, well, we'll have to create another function, I'm guessing. So if uh, cell.contains, so we'll have to create this contains method soon. If it contains x and y, then we can safely set the column to equal the cell.column. So let's head up to our cell and create that contains function. So our class cell contains x and y as a parameter. So all we have to do is return x is greater than this dot left and x is less than this dot right and y is greater than this dot top and y is less than this dot bottom. That should work. So head back down to our highlight cell. Here we go. So we're getting the column. Now once we get the column, well it's possible that we won't get a column. So if col still equals null, then we won't highlight anything. We'll just return. It's possible when they've got their mouse cursor off the edge of the frame, off the edge of the grid. So what do we want to do here? We want to highlight the first unoccupied, unoccupied cell. That is, when we put a piece in the first column, we want to highlight the bottom of that column. If there were already pieces there, we'd highlight the next available spot. So we'll have to loop through the rows backwards. So for let i equals the grid rows minus 1, i is greater than or equal to 0, i minus minus, so we're just looping through backwards. So if the uh, grid i col, so col we already know, if that if the owner equals null, that means it's unoccupied, doesn't it? So I'll just grab that so we can safely highlight it. So this dot highlight will equal the player's turn. So whichever player's turn it is, player's turn. Uh, I'm thinking that for the computer AI, we'll need to probably know what we're highlighting. So let's return, return that. It won't hurt to do that anyway. And if it gets through all of that, we'll return null. Nothing was highlighted. So let's give that a go. There we go. So the computer was randomly chosen first, and it's highlighting the bottom cell, the bottom row. Great. Let's even get a yellow. There we are. Looking good. Now let's handle clicks. So head back up to the top where we set up our event listeners. We'll need to create another event listener on our canvas. So canvas.add event listener, this time for a click. And we'll create a function called click. Let's head down and create that. Function click, it takes an event. Now if the game is over, if game over, I'm just thinking ahead here. We'll say if they click, it'll start a new game. So new game, and we'll just return there. Uh, also, if it's not the player's turn, we don't want to be able to do anything with our click. It's the computer's turn, we shouldn't handle clicks. So we'll just return there as well. We'll put that as a to do though, initially, just so that we can test it. And finally, what do we do? Well, we'll create a function called select cell. So let's go down and create that select cell function. Just before set dimension here, function select cell. Uh, we should probably keep track of whether anything is highlighted or not. So we'll say let highlighting equal false. And we'll loop through our, so let 
uh, we'll loop through with using of let a for of loop. So for row of grid for let cell of row. Now if that cell dot highlight doesn't equal null, that means we have highlighting. So we can set that highlighting flag that we had above to equal true. We want to clear the highlighting of the cell, so cell.highlight will equal null, and we want to set its owner now. So cell.owner will equal the player's turn, so whatever player is playing currently. And then we can break. So we'll break to the outer loop. Outer, we'll have to give that a label up here. We could probably also check for a win here, because whenever somebody clicks, selects a cell, there's a chance they could win. So if check, we'll create a function, if check win, we'll certainly need to pass the column and the, the row in the column. So we'll go cell.row, cell.column, and we'll write that function soon. And if that is true, well game over will equal true. So we don't want to allow selection if we haven't got any highlighting. So don't allow selection if no highlighting. So we can just go if not highlighting, return. Just to make it safe. And finally, we want to switch the player. So switch the player if the game isn't over, if no game over. So if not game over, we'll switch the player. So we can go players turn equals not players turn. So let's go up and implement this check win function. We'll just set something up primarily. Function check win, it takes a row and a column, and we'll just return false here. So we'll put a to do here, to do check win. Currently we'll just return false, we'll never be able to win. Let's try that out. So yellow, click, oh yeah. So if you see that when I put, I hover my mouse over that yellow one, it goes up to the next, uh, the next row, that's looking good. Yeah, it seems to be working well. What happens when we get to the top? Yeah, we can't do anything there. Clicking doesn't do anything. Great, so we fill it all up. We're not checking for a win yet, but we'll implement that shortly. Awesome. Just make sure that clears when I reset. Yeah, looking good. First of all, let's set up some text to show who wins. So head right up the top. We're going to set up some constants first. So just under where we've set up these colors, let's set up some text. So we'll have constant text uh, comp. That'll be the computer. And we'll have one for the player. Player, and we'll probably need to take care of ties or draws. So text tie, we'll just say draw. And when somebody wins, we'd like to say, for example, computer wins. So we'll have text win, and that can just be wi wins. While we're here, we may as well set up some color for the tie. So color tie, uh, let's make it a darker color so it stands out. Dark gray, for example. And color tie dark, well, anything darker than dark gray would be black, I assume. And we'll probably also need to highlight the pieces when somebody wins to make it clear where the win occurred. So how about we have color, we'll just call it color win, and it can also be black. We should probably keep track of whether the game is tied or not, so just head down to our game variables. Next to game over there, let's create one called game tied. Uh, inside our loop function, we'd like to draw our text. So let's go down and create that now, just after draw grid. Function, draw, 
draw text. Uh, I'm thinking we'll need to initialize the game uh, tied inside our new game. So just where we've got game over equals false, we'll also have game tied equals false. So head back up to our draw text. So we only want to draw text when the game is over. So if not game over, return. We don't want to do anything. So the first step will be to set up the uh, text parameters. Set up text parameters. Uh, we'll need a text size. So let size equal, we'll base it off the height of the cell. We'll say that it's equal to the height of a cell. So we can go grid 0, 0, dot height, dot h. Uh, we'll need to set the color, the fill style. So fill style, that will be depending on whether the game is tied or not. So we'll test for that first. Game tied. So if the game is tied, we'll use color tie. Otherwise, we'll test whether it's the player's turn or not. So if it's the player's turn, that means the player has won. So color play, else color computer. We'll need to set up the font. So context.font will equal the size, the text size, plus that'll be in pixels, so px. Now we need to select a, a font type. So deja vu sans mono is what I'm going to use, sans mono. Uh, we'll need to set up a line width because we'll be putting a stroke around the edge of the text. Line width will equal, we'll base it on the size. We'll say it's size divided by a 10. Uh, we'll have to center the text. Actually, we'll need to set the color of that as well. So context.stroke style will equal, it'll be similar to what we have here. So I'll just copy that, except that we'll be using the darker color. So tie dark, color play dark, and comp dark, dark red. And we'll also need to center the text, as I said earlier. Text align will equal center. And context.text baseline will equal middle. Now we can draw the text. Draw the text. We'll have to work out our text first. So let text equal, we can just do something similar to how we worked out the colors before, except when the game is tied, we'll have text tie. When it's the player's turn, we'll have text play. Else we'll have text comp. So if the game is tied, we'd like to center the text on the screen. So let's do context. We'll do our stroke first, so that's slightly under, it's under the fill. Stroke text. The text will be just text. The position will be, the X position will be width divided by two. The Y position will be height of our canvas divided by two. And for the fill text, it'll be very similar except we'll just change that to fill text. If the game is not tied, else we want to do something similar, except that we want to offset it slightly because we'd like the player's name, for example, player wins. Wins will be below the name. So we'll have to apply an offset here, minus offset. We'll figure that out soon. Offset. And we'll just copy all of that for the wins as well, the text win. We'll just change that to text uh, win. Put that down there. But that'll be plus the offset, plus the offset. So this offset will just decide up here. Let offset equal, it'll be based on the size of the text. So size times say 0 0.55. Just take a guess. In order to test this, we'll have to go up to our check win function check win and change that to true. So we'll always win when we place a piece. Let's give that a go. So yellow should win here. Player wins. That's looking okay. If I click again, it should restart. Yeah. Computer wins. Uh, the only issue I see is that there's these spikes on some of the letters like W and N and so on. That's to do with the line join. So head back down to our, where we set up our text, draw text where we have line width, just above that, let's set the line join to equal round in quotes. Let's test that. 
Uh, can't see any, it looks okay. If I click again, try to get the computer player. Here we go. Yep, yeah, it's definitely gone, that's looking good. Great. So head back up to check win. We'll just change that back to uh, false, so we'll never win. And we'll head down to where we are checking for the win initially. So that's when we're selecting a cell. Every time we select a cell, we wish to check for the win. But also, we'd like to check for whether the game is tied or not. So just after, before we switch the player, check for a tied game. So first of all, we have to check whether anybody has won or not. So we can go if not game over. That means nobody has won as yet. We can safely test for a tied game. Now, what is a tied game? Well, it's when all the board is full, but nobody has won. There's no conclusive result. So in order to check for that, we can just loop over all of the grid. First of all though, let's set game tied to equal true, and then we will attempt to disprove it. So looping over the grid for let uh, row of grid for let cell of row. Now, if the cell dot owner, if that equals null, then we can safely say the game hasn't ended yet, right? If any of those cells equal, if there's no owner, we haven't ended the game. So we can set game tied to equal false. So we've just disproved it. And we, there's no more need to continue through this loop. So we can just set a break point here. Break, we'll break to the outer loop. So I'll just set up a label here. So if the game is tied, if game tied, we can also say that the game is over. So game over equals true. That's so that our other logic will work. So set game over. To test this, how about we set up a smaller grid? So head right up the top, and we'll change the number of columns to say three, and the number of rows to two. Let's give that a go. So when we get, when we fill up this grid, doesn't matter what pieces we put, it should be a tie. Draw, great, that's looking okay. And you'll find that whenever we don't have a win, we should get a draw if the grid is full. That's good. Put those ones back. Now let's write a function to test whether we have four in a row or not. So just after our check win here, let's create a function called uh, connect four the titular name, and we're going to pass in a single dimensional array here. So we'll just call that cells. We'll give it a default value, just so that we can declare it as a, an array. Now what will we do here? Well, we want to loop over the cells and determine whether we have four of the same color in a row or not. So let's keep track of how many cells we have in a row of the same color. We'll call that count. So let count equal zero initially. We'll also need to keep track of the last owner. So for example, if the last owner was yellow and this is yellow, we can safely add to the count. So we'll set that to null. And we should also keep track of the winning cells. Uh, that's just an empty array to begin with. That's so that we can add some highlighting when the game ends to make it clear where we won. So let's loop over the array. So let i equal zero. i is less than the cells dot length. i plus plus. So first of all, if there's no owner, so no owner, we want to reset the count. So if cells i dot owner equals null. That means it's an empty cell, doesn't it? We want to reset the count to nothing. Count will equal zero, and we might as well reset the winning cells while we're here. Winning cells will equal an empty array. Now, if we have the same owner, same owner, we want to add to the count. So else if the cells i dot owner equals our last owner, 
then we can add to our count, so count plus plus, and we can push to that winning cells array. Winning cells dot push cells i. If none of that is true, we have a new owner, don't we? So new owner, new count. So else count will equal one because we must include the current cell. Uh, we should clear the winning cells before we populate it. Winning cells will equal an empty array. And winning cells will add to it by going push cells i, which is the current cell. And finally, we'll have to uh, set the last count. Set the last, sorry, the last owner. So last owner will equal cells i dot owner. Now we need to handle the win. So four in a row is a win. So simply if count equals four, then well, we want to return true. But firstly, we need to do something with those winning cells. So let's loop over them. So for let cell of winning cells. How about we set up a property soon called winner on each of the cells. So cell.winner equals true. We want to return true here. That means we have connected four. Now if we get through all of that loop, without returning true, well, we want to return false. We haven't connected for. So let's head up to our cell object and we'll add that property. So this is our cell object inside the constructor, just down the bottom. This dot winner equals false. There is no winner initially. And where we draw the circle, so just where we're drawing the highlighting, we'll just piggyback off that, I think. So if this dot winner or this dot highlight doesn't equal null. We'll have to set up the color for the win. So if this dot winner, we'll set the color to, we did set up a color for the win. Yes, color win. Otherwise, we'll do what we've always done here. So let's head down to our check win function. Get rid of all of that. So what do we want to do here? Well, we know the row and column of the current cell. So we want to grab the horizontal, the vertical, and each of the diagonals. So let's say get all the cells from each direction and set up some arrays. So we'll have diagonal left, which will equal an empty array. We'll have diagonal right, an empty array. We'll have the horizontal. Horizontal will equal an empty array. And the vertical. Vert will equal an empty array. Now we can loop over our grid. So for let i equal zero, i is less than grid rows, i plus plus. For let j equals zero, j is less than grid cols, I, uh, j plus plus. First, let's populate our horizontal cells. So horizontal cells. So when do they occur? Well, it's when i equals the row. When i equals row, then we can populate our horizontal. So we can push to our horizontal array. So we'll push the current cell. So grid i j. I'll just copy that. Vertical cells are very similar. Vertical cells are if j equals col. We have the vertical cells. So we'll push to our vertical array push that current cell to our vert. Now we can handle the diagonals. So let's start with the top left to bottom right. So let's think about it. If the cell 2, 2 comes in, well on that diagonal would be 1, 1 and 0, 0 and 3, 3. So we could handle that by going if i minus j equals rho minus col, well, that's on the diagonal. We can push to the diag L. Diag L dot push the current cell. Similarly, for the other diagonal, so this will be the top right to the bottom left. 
for example, 2-2, two, two, the next one would be 3-1. So that would just be the opposite. i plus j will equal, so if i plus j equals row plus column, then we can push to the diag right. Now we can return a win or not. So if any have four in a row, return a win. So we can just go return connect four for the diagonal left or connect four for the diagonal right or return connect for diagonal, sorry, horizontal or connect for vertical. So if any of those are true, then the current player has won. So let's give that a go. Okay, there's our initial. Let's test for a horizontal win first. So we'll try to get a yellow win here. Great, player wins. And there's our highlighting to show where the win occurred. The only thing is we don't have uh, highlighting turned off during that. We'll fix that up shortly. Let's try again. Uh, we'll try red in the horizontal. Computer wins. Great. Let's try the vertical. Computer wins. Great. And the diagonal. We'll try to get a red win here. Computer wins. It's looking good. I'll just try one more going to the right hand side. Computer wins. Good. It's looking good. Probably we could do more testing, but we'll let that be for the time being, I think. So let's just tidy up those to do's that we had. So in the click function, we should be returning when it's not the player's turn, meaning that we can't click during the computer's turn. And the next one, oh, this is our highlighting issue that we had at the end of game. Just get rid of that. So in the highlight grid function, we don't want to highlight during game over or when it's not our turn. So that should be okay. Let's just give it a quick test. It won't work because the player, see the computer can't act yet. We haven't automated it yet. So that will be our next, I'll just get to the player's turn. There we go. So if I click here, the computer doesn't do anything. We haven't programmed it yet. So let's do that now. So to automate the computer, let's go back up to the top. Inside our loop function, where we have update here, let's create a function called go computer. We'll pass our delta, time delta. So head down to after our draw functions. Let's create the function, function go computer with a delta. If it's the player's turn, we don't want to run this function. If player's turn or game over, let's just return. We'll probably want to add some delay before the computer makes its selection. So it will highlight the cell it's planning to select and then select it at a given time afterwards. So how about we say count down till the computer makes its selection. So if, we'll have to make this variable soon. So if time comp is greater than zero, then we want to decrement it, time comp minus equals the delta from, from above. Now if ever that time comp equals zero, or less than or equal to zero, then that means we finished counting down and we want to select the cell. And while we're counting down, we don't want to do anything else, we'll just return. So we'll need to set up that time comp initially. So probably the last thing we'll do in this go computer function is set the delay. So we can go time comp will equal some delay that we create above, delay comp we'll call it. So let's go up the top and create these variables. So just after here in the game variables, we'll create that time comp. And up in our constants, just above grid circle there, we'll create a constant called delay comp, which will equal say half a second, 0.5. And this will be the seconds for the computer to take its turn. In order to test this, let's go down to our go computer function. 
we'll have to highlight a cell. Let's just hard code it initially. Highlight the selected cell. So we can call that highlight cell function. It takes an X and a Y value. So let's just hard code it to be the leftmost column. So grid 0, 0, uh, dot CX, comma grid 0, 0, dot CY. So it should always take the leftmost column. Let's give that a go. Yeah, it is doing so. Okay, and if I put one on top of it, yeah, it selects on top of me. Looking good. So we'll need the computer to decide which column is it going to select. So we'll put a variable there called col. The uh, row doesn't matter because we've programmed it, so it doesn't matter which row you highlight, it will highlight the correct cell. And ultimately we want to randomly select a, a column in priority order. So let col. So let's set up these priorities. Uh, we'll just set up an array called, say, options. So set up the options array. So what options does the computer have? So let options equal an empty array. Now each row will represent the priorities. So options zero, which will equal an empty array, will be the highest priority. And that's for the computer to win, isn't it? Computer wins. If the computer can place a piece and win, it should. So let's make a few more options. So options one, that's where the computer should block the player from winning. So block the player from winning. We do not want to give away a win as such, do we? Options two, well that'll be probably a move that's of no significance. So it won't give away a win, it won't win. It's just a, a neutral move, so no significance. And the final option, the worst option, is to give away a win. It does not want to give away a win. So we can randomly select a column in priority order now. So if options zero, dot length is greater than zero, that means we can win, we should select one of those. So col will equal options zero, and we'll just randomly select one of them. So we can go math, we'll find the floor to find an integer, math floor of math random multiplied by the length of that array, options zero dot length. And we can do something similar for each of the rows, each of the options as such. Else if, I'll just fill this in first, else if, else if, so else if options one, then we'll select options, something from options one. Else if options two length is greater than zero, we'll select something from it. Otherwise, we'll select something from the worst option, options three. Now we can write our algorithm. So just up here, we'll have to loop through each column because you can only select between the columns. You can't select a particular cell, right? So we'll have to keep track of that cell that we will select though. So let cell, so four, let i equal zero i is less than the grid cols, i++. Plus plus. And to get the cell, we can just use the highlight cell function, which we did program to return the cell. The x will be grid 0, because we don't care about the row, i dot cx, grid 0, i dot cy. The column could be full, so column full, we just want to go to the next column, don't we? Go to the next column. So if cell equals null, that is the highlight cell returns null, then we can just go continue, skip over the remaining uh, part of the loop and go to the next iteration. So now we can test for the first priority, so first priority that is the computer 
wins. So we can go sell dot owner equals player's turn, which is the computer's turn currently. And if there's, we'll check for the win, if check win, so the row will be the cell dot row, cell dot col. So if that's a win, we want to push to the first options array. So options zero dot push, and the column will just be i. Else will handle the second priority. It'll be very similar, so we'll just copy all of this, paste it in there. So this will be the second priority, and that's where the computer, we block the player, don't we? Block the player. Everything will be the same except that we'll set the owner to be equal to not the player's turn, which is the player. We'll check the win. And if that's true, then we want to block it. We'll push it to options one. So the next priority here, else, first we'll want to set the owner back to the uh, computer's turn. So the computer, so we can just go cell.owner will equal player's turn. And then we want to check for the cell above. So if we, by placing this piece in the current column, Will that allow the player to win? So we'll have to check the cell above. So this is only relevant if there is a cell above. So we can put a check here. If cell.row is greater than zero, that means it has rows above it. We can select that cell above. We'll select the owner. So grid, uh, the row will be cell.row minus one and the column will be cell.col, and we can set the owner to equal not player's turn. So now we can test for the last priority, so just copy some of that. So last priority, that is don't let player win. We don't need that line. So if check win cell row minus one, cell col, well, we'll push to the final priority, options three dot push i. Else it's the third priority, that is there's no significance. So third priority, no significance. It won't hurt to put it there. So we don't need to check for a win, we can just put an else here, else, options to push i. We'll have to deselect the cell above, so just grab this here, and after here we can deselect cell above, set that to null. Uh, we'll also have to handle the else condition in here, so that'll be the same as this third priority. So this is for, so currently we're checking for the cell.row is greater than zero. So no row above, third priority, no significance. It's completely safe for the uh, computer to place a piece in the top row. And just one last thing, we just need to cancel the highlight and the selection. So cancel, highlight and selection. So we can go cell.highlight will equal null and cell.owner uh, will equal null. I think we're ready to test this. Let's give it a go. So hopefully the play of the computer will play intelligently. So at the moment it's just randomly placing stuff. Oh. Uh, I see the problem there, it's highlighting the win because we're temporarily selecting it. We'll just have to deselect that first. So just after the for loop, just in here, we can clear the winning cells. So we can just loop over for let uh, row of grid for let cell of row and we can just set the cell.winner to equal false. Now let's try that. 
So the computer went first. I'll try to go for a win and see if it blocks me. It did. Try again. Yeah, it's blocking me. Will it go for a win if I put one here? Oh, it did. Uh, but it could have been just blocking me though. We'll have to test this out a little bit. I'll just play a few games. So the only one, the only way to beat the computer is to set up a double win. So if you look here, I do that. So I could have won there or I could have won there. That's the only way to beat it. So it's pretty, it's a pretty powerful AI really. There we go. And that's the end of this tutorial to create the game Connect 4. I hope you've enjoyed it just as much as I've enjoyed creating it. Uh, feel free to download the code and modify it to your heart's content. Until next time, talk to you then. Bye.